Hey guys, and welcome to this week's episode of Bear Archery's Hunting 101. I am excited about today's episode. I've got Troy Fowler, uh, aka the Ranch Fairy, on. Now, like him, love him, or hate him, he's he's a fun guy. Um, he has a crazy, wild personality that's just kind of hard not to like. Um, but Troy is also very, very educated. Uh, he's a very intelligent guy, and he knows his stuff. So we were talking about uh, arrows, and we're talking about heavy arrow setups. We're talking about tuning arrows. We're talking about broadheads and the importance of sharpness. Uh, we're talking about everything, but the consensus of the entire episode is the best arrow that you could ever shoot is the one that you personally have confidence in. So this episode is not meant to persuade you. It's not meant to change your mind and try and tell you that your arrow setup is wrong. It's just simply uh, his thoughts. Um, it's simply what he has found to work, what he's profound to form, perform well. Uh, but if you have a setup you like, this is definitely not going to be bashing um, you know, a light arrow setup with a 100 grain expandable broadhead because I even shoot that sometimes. So uh, that's not what this episode is, but I promise you it's going to be an informative episode. You will learn something. And as always, this episode is brought to you by our good friends over at Sitlock. So let's jump in and talk with the Ranch Fairy. Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast, where hunters new and old come to learn and find inspiration from stories of hunts gone by. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the outdoor way of life, and there is no better time to start than right now. So let's head into the great outdoors with your host, Dylan Ray. Guys, I know, I know, uh, cheap, interchangeable blade knives, they're all in the rage. Change your blade right there, and you can keep going, and... It's cool, and I have one in my bag, and I like to keep one in my bag. However, there is no replacement for a well-built, hand-forged knife, something that I know is dependable, it's strong. If I pick it up, it's going to be sharp, it's going to be ready to go. Um, these right here are knives built by my good friend Nick Deeker, Nick's Knife Works. And um, the most beautiful part of this is, it's not cut and dry. You don't just pick out a knife and say, well, I guess that's the one I need. No, 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 no. He built this one specifically to the length that I wanted it. I wanted this to fit right on the side of my binocular harness so it was always there, always ready for me to grab. He built this one to fit really small in my pocket uh, for an everyday carry. Guys, a good hand-forged knife is worth its weight in gold. Go check out Nick Deeker at nicksknifeworks.com. All right, Troy. Well, let man, let's just start at the very beginning. First off, where the heck did the name Ranch Ferry come at from? Every podcast. Yeah, we got to know. Jonas and the Meat Eater guys, everybody asks me that. So I'm the uh, ranch manager of our place. It's actually my wife's family's place in South Texas. And um, more than a decade ago, I realized everybody wanted everything to be perfect, but nobody wanted to do the work. And I kind of like tinkering and building fence and fixing things. So I started calling myself the Ranch Fairy as opposed to Uncle Troy. And I have 38 nieces and nephews and there's <laughs> nine kids, 10. Julie has nine siblings. So I am Uncle Troy to half the earth. And um, I started calling myself the Ranch Fairy. And then when I decided to start the YouTube channel, I typed it into Google and nothing came up. So you're either really unique named, which is, you know, totally flies in the face of the tough guy bow hunting stuff. And then, um, or you're, or you're super popular to get the algorithms to run. And I have no marketing plan. I had no business plan. I was just going to start a YouTube <laughs> channel, but I went, okay, well that's unique. No one's going to forget that. Half the world doesn't know my name, which is fine. And, um, or my real name, my, my God given name. And, um, so I went with it and I figured it would just either take off. Or I like fail. it. Yeah. So it was kind of a now shot. I remember. I remember the first time it kind of ever came up. Um, I, I think it was Aaron and somebody else, uh, War Britain, that were on the show, mm -hmm. and we were talking about our bow setups, and they mentioned something about the ranch ferry, and I'm like, "What did you just say? <laughs> like, what? Wait, 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 wait. What are we talking yeah, about?" Right. Oh, <laughs> and uh, and they're like, "Yeah, dude, have you not have you not checked it out?" And I'm like, "No, man, I have no idea what you're talking about." Mm -hmm. 
And uh, and so I took a deep dive into Ranch Ferry, and I'm just like, he's my favorite person. Well, thank you. Like he's just, it's awesome. Thank you very much. It's awesome. So, where did the, what spurred the, uh, I don't want to say addiction, but that's almost what it is in my opinion of heavy arrows of this bone crushing heavy arrow setups. One hundred percent. And I think that's why my channel. I don't really, I'm not really good at Instagram. I don't look at my metrics. I don't pay attention to any of that stuff. I just post stuff and I'm not going to do it. I'm a 53 years old. I, I have enough. I just don't have the thing to constantly just drive my brand like a wild Indian. But there was a hole in the bow hunting space that I did not know existed as great as it does of having arrows just not do what they should. And then watching the hunting public, and I'll get to the point watching the hunting public guys. I was, I'm not familiar with swinging out of a tree, hunting public, taking the shots you got to take. And then I started watching other public guys and I said, wow, you don't really have a choice. Like we hunt over bait and stuff down here. So if a deer comes in, you can kind of wait a little bit and they'll turn or whatever and get a decent angle. But when you're going up in a tree and you're a mile from the truck, deer, two, th- you know, three deer comes by and here comes a buck and he just doesn't give you a shot. You don't shoot. Or you shoot a bad angle. My yeah. story is I killed a Pope and Young deer in 2008. I haven't shot a deer since. I just gave up. Why? I just don't care to shoot them. Well, about that time, my kids came along and we've killed nine million deer together and all my nieces and nephews and stuff. I just don't care to kill them over. But I never gave up. So you're on still the, deer hunting. Yeah. You're just not pulling the trigger. Yeah, I was deer hunting plenty. I got a gun I just put up that has 30 names on it. And people have killed their first animal with that rifle on our place. Yeah, I've, pl- I've killed plenty of deer. That's I just cool. hadn't killed them. But I didn't um, I didn't lose hunting a big feral hog. So I started to specialize. And I stopped shooting every pack of pigs that came in. And I started trying to shoot the big ones. And on our place, a, a big one's about six feet long from nose to tail, and they're about 200 plus pounds. That We don't have any agriculture, so they don't get real big. In West Texas, they get 300, 350s because there's a lot of agriculture. Like if they if, if there was pigs in the right. Midwest, they'd be 500 pounds because they just eat all the time. But yeah. my pigs work pretty hard. So I had cameras. I was doing everything a trophy whitetail hunter would do, and I would just pass pigs. They'd come into the feeders, and if, I, if the right one wasn't there, I'd just let them go. Because I was hunting a pig. It would take 10 or 12 hunts to get him in front of me. And I, I bet you at one time shooting all standard platforms up to about 2015, I was 50% recovery. And I was wow. at 17 yards. I mean, I don't shoot far. Wow. I get made fun of a lot because I'm the guy that sits at the dare feeder shooting pigs all over bait. Well, you come try it, brother. <laughs> it, it's a little more exhilarating than you think. And, um, oh, I love, no, pig it's hunting. super fun. Pig hunting's one of my favorite things on earth to do. Oh yeah. And then um, people, people ask me all the time. People ask me all the time. Why don't Turkey hunt? And I'm like, well, simple fact, I can hunt in Kansas and I can shoot one bird mm-hmm. or I can drive down to Oklahoma and Texas and shoot 10 pigs. Nobody a weekend. cares. You, why, why wouldn't you do that? Right. Like I'm, I'm in the killing business, dude. So if I can kill 10 pigs versus one Turkey, uh, I'm going to talk. No, I'm a hog hunt every time. So. I just taken it to the next level of I started hunting the big ones. And it's just because I had a yeah. lot of them. I mean, I'm down there a lot. I'm down there just being in the ranch ferry a lot, break, fixing broken stuff, and then I'll go hunting in the afternoon, right? So yeah, I was struggling on the great big ones. And it was pissing me off because I was putting a lot of time into trying to kill the big ones. And so there wasn't any, this is 2013, 14 or whatever. There wasn't anything out. Like they just said, well, they're tough. You go to the archery shop and say, well, sometimes things are tough. Okay, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a respiratory therapist. I had cadavers for six months in school. I had tests with a human heart in a tray and pins in it, and you had a piece of paper with lines on it. And you had to know what arteries you're looking at. Okay? Yeah. I know it. the internal organs are not tough. They are what they are. If you puncture a lung, you puncture a lung. You yeah. puncture the lungs, you hit the you hit the major arteries over the heart, nothing survives. Elephants to mice. It's all the same. God didn't yeah. make 17 different cardiopulmonary systems. He made one that worked and punched it around and everything and made it all about the same. 
with the exception of pigs, I don't know what that is with all the biblical stuff about pigs. They got six loaves in their lungs, which is weird. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> just a known fact. I said, uh, I read Dr. Ed's Natal study, which was 30 years of, you know, all he studied was penetration. And I said, well, I'm 50% right now. I have nothing to lose going to a 650 grain arrow. I have zero to lose because I'm not doing that great right now. And if it doesn't work, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I'll just pull out my guns and start blasting them. So I built a 650. Now, the first one I really shot was probably 550. So I put, I spined up from a 340. I was shooting 70 at 28 at the time. I spined up to 300, which is crazy, from a 340. And I put a 100 grain brass insert in and I put a Magnus Stinger 125 on it, which was crazy. I went to 125 grains. I was feeling like a freak. And I'm at 520, you know, bow looks slow. And I start freaking killing them. I'm talking about if I make a mistake, they get away. If I don't make a mistake, they never make it 100 yards. If you make a bad shot yeah. or hit them in the spine and they duck it, Okay, outside of the human error, I'm talking about before I was hitting pretty good, getting half an error, and I'm still not getting half of them. This is the big ones. So for all you people that shoot pigs, I shot 40 pigs. Yeah, they're all 100 pounders. They're not the same. They're just not the same. Bone not structure, the shield, the mud, all that, right? So I start just whacking them. So I built a 670 grain arrow. I grabbed my longbow. I bare shaft tuned it. I got the head that Ed shot, which is, this is similar to it. This is the Grizzly 190. It's three inches okay. long, one inch wide. He actually narrowed them. He actually would grind them down to seven eighths of an inch wide for shooting buffaloes. That's the exact head. I put it on my arrows, and I went strolling around with my longbow, and I killed the biggest pig to date that I've killed on the ranch. It would weigh 265 pounds. God. And I shot him quartering two at 15 yards on the ground with him. And I shot him right there. And it went with a longbow. With a longbow, it was going 150 feet per second. Now, remind you, this is a 26% four to center, 670 grain arrow that's bare shaft perfect. And the arrow uh, hit right here. It went chut, and the broadhead popped out his butt. Five feet of penetration. Jeez. He went 50 yards. Now, I've got a lot of stuff I want to talk about, so I don't want to I don't want to get off track here, but you mentioned something that, that I'm curious to ask you about. You said perfect bear shaft tuned. I have found that when I crank out an incredibly high FOC arrow on any recurves, mm -hmm. that I have to, sh and, and this might be I understand that the way that you hook your string, I'm, I'm not, I'm not asking you to solve the world's problems because I know every shooter is different, but I have found that when I crank out a super high FOC arrow, I have to have a super high knock point in order to get that arrow to fly. Oh, dude, were you bear shaft? So, yeah. So, if, so for instance, if we're taking a, if I'm shooting a 400 grain arrow, um, and it's cut to 29 inches and I'm shooting, you know, 150 out front, okay. um, then my knock height might be five eighths of an inch. Did you, Whereas did you cut the shaft if I at start all or did you leave the shaft one length? Uh, I just cut it to wherever it, so, so that's the problem. Okay. I know what you, I know where you're going. I'll, I'll solve your world's problem. Okay. So that's, yeah, I mean, and then, and then if you go to, you know, say I jump up to a 300 spine and I want to run 315 out front, all of a sudden I've got to raise my knock point up to an inch. Okay, so what you're experiencing is called right. paradox. It happens with all longbows and recurves. They bend around the riser, even the center shot stuff. And right. if you don't tr keep cutting the shaft shorter, it won't stiffen up to the point that it'll ever stop doing that. So the way to so you're getting knock high because of a weak shaft. Yeah, it's weak. So what you do is you find you take an arrow and you take it, you get ten yards from the target, shoot it full length, bear shaft, and it should go to the right. I'm right-handed, so if you're left, it goes left. Right. It should bend sideways. Yep. Okay, we're soft. Great. Cut it. Cut an inch off the knock end. 
Leave the point yep. set. Shoot it again. It will bend less. Yeah. Because you're stiffening it up. You keep cutting it. All of a sudden, you'll hit this point and it'll start going straight. That's the length. That's it. So my question, my question is this: I have I have bear shaft tuned um, to get knock right and left out, but now I'm hitting way knock high. Are your three fingers if under? I, if I'm shooting a super, yes. I don't. If I'm shooting a super high FOC arrow, that's what. And, and you know, I've just heard. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Tom Clum, but. Um, Basically, his response was, well, when you go to a crazy high FOC, it's just you get knock high. And, and I just didn't know if, if you had had that experience. or I'm going to go mess with it now. I don't know the answer to your question. I honestly don't. Um, it's not true. But Ed did it. <laughs> so what's your, what's your, Do you know the height of your knock point? Oh, God, it couldn't be. No, I don't measure that. I just... I, if it's shooting knock low, I raise it. If it's shooting knock high, you know, whatever, I yeah. move it around. I don't have a, I don't use a square. Yeah, that's what, that's the only reason I asked. That's what I found is that, you know, if I'm shooting um, a, a not at high FOC arrow, then I get, you know, five eighths of an inch on my knock height. But when I start increasing that FOC, I've got to keep moving that knock point up and up and up until it's, you know, an inch high, which a lot of people are like, dude, that's way too high. No, I would agree that's, that's just way too high. You, can, you need to get your saw out and cut the shaft and do it that way and see if it does the same results. It may okay. still be a little off. Oh, you said the left to right. Yeah. You said it is hitting perfect bear shaft left to right, hitting plumb. Yeah. On target yeah. too. Yeah. It's just knock height. The 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 way the arrow is sticking in the target. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that knock question. High. I haven't had that problem. But I don't shoot three fingers under, so that may be it. I don't know. I shoot regular. Uh, uh, yeah. That could be it. He said um, I shoot uh, I shoot regular. I don't shoot like a dummy. What's well what's <laughs> right. What's spinning through my head is we shot uh three hundred and forty spawn arrow out of my compound with four hundred grains up front. It it shot not it shot point high. It, we had a high speed camera. Really? And it went in and it, and, and the tail went down and the point it hit the hit the paper. It tore like a foot, and it was point high. Oh my gosh! Out of a compound. So hey. now you got me. Okay, great. I got another video. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer the question. You'll get a kick at. You'll get a kick out of this. Mm -hmm. I uh, through college, I worked at a bow shop, so yeah. I worked my way through college. We had this guy come in, and uh, he said. I bought this air, this bow from you guys about a week ago, and this thing's garbage. And we're like, okay, okay like what? You got you got to tell us what's going on. He's like, dude, it breaks every arrow I shoot through it. And we're like, what do you what do you mean? He's like, I've shot, I've had seven arrows explode on me. Explode. And we're like, oh, okay. And uh, we're like, what? Well, do you have your arrows with you? And he's like, yeah, they're out in my truck. So he goes and grabs them, and they are wooden arrows. Like that you would buy for a little kid's yeah, bow. Yeah, I can't. I, God like help from, you people. Let the bow shop <laughs> people have all kind of fun. Like from Walmart. <laughs> okay, so I have a question. And he was just exploding these arrows. If you worked in a shop. I assume that meant you know how to tune a bow and make it shoot an arrow. Okay. Okay, so if I decide I'm going to shoot a standard platform, I got 65 and 28 and a half. That's me. Okay. And I want to shoot a 340. And a 100 grain point. So it's, in my opinion, that's way underspined, but it's very common. Okay. Oh yeah. And then you take me in the back and we're just shooting. Let's just say we're doing a flesh tune, like normal, like 99% of people do. Paper tuning. Right. Just seven yards away or whatever, they, whatever you tell me to do. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. I got a 340. I can, I know how to operate the bow. I'm not a beginner beginner, but I finally decided I want somebody to teach me how to shoot. Straight. Right. If the thing tears left. I'm right-handed. Theoretically, that's weak. Let's just assume I'm not torquing it. Okay? Correct. Not torquing it bad. From high-speed camera, I know that the arrow's bending like crazy to the left. Okay? okay. When you adjust the bow, what are you doing? Well, I'll just change the arrow setup. <laughs> <laughs> would you stiffen somebody up yeah if it's that if it's that weak so you wouldn't you wouldn't just uh flip if it's a you know got a y yoke in it i got a yoke in it where you wouldn't just do that and just change the cams and 
twist up the strings and all that stuff. Now, maybe, maybe 10 years ago when I worked at the bow shop, I mm-hmm. would have, but I have found, and, and maybe this is because I experiment a lot now in traditional yeah, archery, right. but it's that I have found, let's get your arrow shooting for the bow and then we can fine tune the bow. So if it's that far off, I would say we need to adjust the arrow and then we can fine tune the bow. Okay, so then if you get, let's say you get the tear from three inches to an inch and a half and it improved it when you went up in spine. Yes. When you adjust the bow, what are you, then you would, what are you adjusting? You would increase the, the amount of, you would tw- put a twist in the yoke if it has a yoke on it. Right. And then what does that do? To increase it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's the answer I expected. I don't know the mechanics. I, okay, so here's, I don't know what, the I, mechanics here's what I think. Of compounds. Right, here's what I think from high-speed camera, because there's a lot of people shooting 400 spine arrows out of a 60-pound yeah. bow, right? They're trying to go fast, Yeah. okay? And it's fine. I don't care. Um, I might have Dudley in front of me in, a, in about three weeks, and I'm going to ask him the same question. But Where are you going to have Dudley in front of you at? I think he's coming to Austin to do – we're going to – there's some deal here at Archery Country. The guys at Archery Country here in Austin are real good friends with him, and I think he's coming in for a place, uh, some kind of a thing. We're going to do – Rocket Man and I are actually talking at the thing, which is weird. But um, we're giving a – I was hoping you were going to say you were coming to Pope and Young Convention because no. he's one of our speakers. No, i got to go fishing. This, you guys all want to go to these conventions <laughs> in the spring, go to the turkey thing and all that. I'm like, good God, go bass fishing. It's the spawn. What are you all doing? But uh, yeah, I think from high speed camera, hang on, where's Big Jake? Okay. This is named after Jake from the honey public. He, I don't know who broke the tip off of my broadhead. So you're shooting your bow that's underspined right handed and it goes like this. I mean, it bends like that. And then takes off like a wheel. Yeah. And I know this is a fact from high speed camera. So that means it's launching this direction. There's no other way it could go. It goes like that. It bends and it launches and it's going to follow that curve when it comes off the string. And then it's going to take yeah. off and it's going to go like this downrange. I think, but I can't prove. I like your answer. I don't know. I think what we're doing is we are taking the string. So I'm going to move up here. I think we're taking the string and making it do this and offset. And it and the string is actually the arrow's going this way and the string's going that way. And trying to get yeah. it back on the shot line and get the point on the shot so line. So you, I think. You are changing the string angle, which of course, and that's why I said I would rather look at your arrow and, and get a well-tuned yeah. arrow before we start doing that to the bow. Um, yeah. Which is it? Which is which is my heavy appeal to traditional archery? Because you pick up a traditional bow and you have to figure out what arrow flies best for this bow. Like I need to mate an arrow to this bow that this bow likes. I need to change point weight and length of the arrow to get a. I, and, and so you're you are tuning that arrow to that bow. So many guys, they just take their arrows in. Whatever arrow it may be, yeah, you're right. Uh, a 400 with a, a 100 grain broadhead mm-hmm. out front, cut right to the front of the mm-hmm. riser. It's way underspined. And they take it to the bow shop, and the bow shop then tunes their bow, bringing it out of tune just to shoot that arrow good. Yeah, that's always that's why I have the test kits and stuff. I say just leave your bow pretty square and make the air, make it shoot the arrows. That's why we yeah. have all these random test kit things. It's kind of a trad hybrid compound thing because. Yeah. The bow press thing is really kind of witchcraft, and there's not really a lot of people who – I mean, and the shop guys know it, but the average guy can't do it in his backyard. It's a lot of experimentation. But you can take a bunch of right. different arrows and bend them different by changing the point weight, and any redneck can do that. And you got one piece of paper, cut out a box, put a square in it, tape it on there, put it at seven yards, and change constantly change the arrow platforms until one jumps yep. off and performs better than the rest. And often three do. Yeah. So if you take a 300 in a compound am, world, take 300 and a 250 and put a bunch of points on them, you might find three combinations and go, oh, okay, you know, I like that broadhead, yeah. and then make a 150. I'm going to shoot that. Yeah, 100%. And that's yeah. what 
So I, I basically essentially did the same thing with my wife, which I do want to ask you about her setup. But I basically did the same thing with her. We found three arrows. You know, one was a 400 spine cut to 27 and a half with 125 out front. What's her draw weight? She, that, that flew. Her draw weight's 47 pounds. Okay. Yeah, she's fine. Okay. Um, 25 inches, 47 pounds. Uh, but anyways, I found three different combinations that all flew great. Okay. You know, one was a cutthroat, cutthroat 125. One was a, I don't even remember now. But anyways, and then I'm like, well, babe, all these three fly great. So now it's just whichever you like, pretty much. I mean, I know which one I like. I shoot cutthroats on everything, but I know which one I like, but but it's basically up to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, that, I did want to ask you about that. I, I get that question a lot. And the only reason I have an answer is because of failure with my wife. Uh, but I get that question a lot of I've got a daughter or a son or a wife. They can't pull a lot of weight and they're having trouble with penetration. What's an arrow setup you would recommend? So let's look at my wife. 25 inches, 47 pounds. What arrow setup would you recommend? I would try to get her over 500 grains. 525, really? yeah. My buddy Rob Nielsen, his wife is a little tiny woman. She shoots 39 pounds at 25 and a half inches. She shoots 570 grains at 30, almost 30% forward to center. And she is shot completely through three bull nil guy. Nil guy are like cool. elk on steroids. She shot completely yeah. through them. Yeah. She thinks deer are kind of funny. Like she just shoots them. She doesn't think twice about it. So perfect flight's got to win. And then I would just have more, I would just have more mass because it really does down range. It doesn't, it's slower, but it doesn't slow down. And then heavy things are heavy no matter what. They're always heavy. Now, and I, I'll be honest, I was in the same boat yep. as a lot of these guys. But to think about my wife shooting 47 pounds and increasing the arrow weight, I'm like, man, I just can't do it. Well, and, you, there's uh, always I limitations, her, right? You'd have to shoot closer. Yeah. Well, I just couldn't. I So originally she was shooting a 500 spine, you know, cut to 25 inches with a 100 grain broadhead on it. Cut on contact broadhead. That's a 300 but I was just like, grain arrow. That's nothing. Exactly. Okay. Um, and I was just like, man, but she's shooting so little. I, I just can't do it. And uh, so I upped her to a 400 spine, went with a brass insert and a 125 oh. cutthroat. Okay. Uh, and and all of a sudden, she's blasting through does. And, yeah. and we're talking Midwestern does that weigh 220 yeah, pounds. Yeah, but you got her up in um, the high 400s, you know? right? You jumped her 100 grains because you put yeah. a brass oh, insert yeah. in there. It's, four, it's 485 now. Is what she's at. She needs to be shooting the single bevel. She is. Yep, single bevel cutthroat. She'll be she'll be okay till she hits one in the shoulder, and then she won't then she won't be okay. Yep. But if she hits them right, single bevel cutthroat. If if she hits them right, then she's going to be fine. That's the problem. That's my whole channel. Plan B. I don't care about Plan A. Ever. Never. Okay. <laughs> Let me play devil's advocate here. Okay. Let me play devil's advocate here. Okay. I am a, a heavy arrow shooter. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, I just built out my new recurve arrows for for the new Eichler uh, riser, and they're they're five ninety five. Um, now I'm a heavy arrow shooter. However, I like to play devil's advocate here. Okay. So, what do you say to the guy? Well, f- first off, let me just say this: if you are a light arrow shooter and you like a a mechanical broadhead, and you say, "Well, dude, I've killed hundreds of deer with them," Fine. and that's what works for me, I'm not here to persuade you. I'm not no, here to tell you you're wrong. That's good. Keep going. The best, yep. the best arrow is the arrow that you have faith in. Let me just say that. Yeah, it's like it's like um, you like a sexy the, shad crankbait, and it works every time because you believe in it. Yeah, I believe absolutely. in that too. So, so don't let me. I don't want people to start. I don't want to get hate mail saying you say archery is for everybody, and then you only promote one kind of. No, it, I'm just telling you what I yeah, shoot. If it's but working, it's if working. you Keep like going. that arrow, yep, yep. absolutely. Um, so, what do you say to the guy? Who says, well, Troy, you say you're planning for plan B mm-hmm. and that a heavy arrow gives you more room for failure, yep. uh, more room for user error, yep. but it also gives you less room for human error because if I 
judge a deer at 24 and it's actually at 20. Well, all of a sudden, a bow that's shooting 220 feet per second versus 280 feet per second, there's a lot less, there's a lot more drop in that. So I actually missed the deer now. Um, whereas opposed to if I'm shooting 280 and I'm four yards off, I still hit the deer and kill it. What you need to do is go get. So what do you say to that guy? I say go get an arrow that is 100 grains heavier than you have and shoot it at 20, shoot it at 30, and shoot it at 40 against your arrow and prove it to me. You're going to be an inch off. Okay. Really? Yep. I've never, I've never right? tested You've never it done like that. that so I've I don't... done it a lot. I just did it with a kid from New Mexico who's a super nice guy, and he's not. he was just learning with us. We did a bunch of pig testing and broke some shoulders. I shot a broadhead through a pig's head this weekend. It was freaking super fantastic. And we were trying, <laughs> we had a prototype that we were breaking and we broke it and there's some, we just need to make adjustments. We kind of knew it had some flaws and we, uh, we broke it. So, um, we were hell on wheels on it. Um, if, and the funny thing was in the plan A hits, it didn't fail. It did fine. It went right through and didn't really? do damage. But when we hit the shoulder blades, started hitting elbow bones and stuff like that, it started to fail. So if you just shot nine deer straight with it, perfect, then you'd have never known it had fail points. But anyway, I grabbed Jeremiah and he's shooting a 340 gold tip stock insert and 100, 100 grand point. And he's a hell on wheels 3D shooter. He's won a bunch of tournaments and some deals that are like 10 tournaments long in New Mexico and stuff. So he's a really good shot on foam. And I gave him a 250 spine that was 130 grains heavier. And out to 40, it was less than an inch and a half off. That's a that's a wow. sight adjustment. That's a sight now, adjustment. I will say this. When I changed my wife's arrow, I mean, she went up, you know, what is that? She went up about 125 grains, grains probably. Ish. Yeah, 130. Okay. I, she didn't have to reshot her bow. I know. Do you know why? She, No. I do. That's why you're here. Great. That's why you're here. <laughs> why would something that's super light so why didn't she? and super heavy shoot in the same place? I don't know. Energy loss, energy waste. That tells you how so, much. That tells you that the bow has more juice than the light arrow gets from it. And when you load it up. Okay. And when you load it up, it pu it's pushing. The light projectile doesn't put as much force on it. So it's got extra stuff left. You bump it up. So that leads me to my next mm -hmm. question. What do you say to the guy who, and I asked you this at ATA. Mm -hmm. What do you say to the guy who says, well, Troy, at what point am I sacrificing so much speed for kinetic energy that I'll never need? Like I'm stacking up all this kinetic energy that I'll never need. And I'm sacrificing so much on the speed side for kinetic energy that, you know, I'm storing up for nothing. You're assuming you're, you're a better shot than you are. You think you're never going to miss. You're not, you're not framing the question correctly. You're not, you think you're never going to hit anything hard ever in your life. That's yeah. what the extra juice is for. And the juice only comes from the mass. So what about, I mean, at what point, at what point do you say, okay, this arrow can bust through any shoulder in North America. I don't need to go any heavier. 650 to 700, but you got to have the right broad end on the front. Okay. So in Ed's study, which was 30 years long, a thousand plus animals with 113 data points. And this is before Microsoft Excel It's 30 years. Okay. The 650 grain arrow with all broadhead platforms increased the bone breaching frequency rate. Now, that may be from a really inefficient head that breaks bone 20% of the time, and now it breaks it 35% of the time. Okay. And then a moderate, let's say, broadhead, let's say it's, it's pretty good steel and cut on contact, but it's four blade, but it's not great steel and it's probably going to flex when it hits something hard. That one may have broke bone. It may have bounced, you know, from 40% to 
once you got over the heavy bone threshold. So at a 500 grain rate uh, weight and then jumping it to 650, it increased. Okay. When you put right. a single bevel on front of it, he had a almost a hundred percent bone breaching rate. But it was the broad Why head is that? and the mass and the tune and the sharp and the can and the dozen band. It's it's a it's an algorithm. Why 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 does single bevel make such the difference? Because when they hit so bones bones break by torque. Everybody, most people have shot rifles and you see the bone explode because it mushrooms and it's delivering a tremendous forward force. And that's what your kind of head sees when it thinks bone breaking. So, um, broad, single bevel broadheads, when they hit moderately soft things don't rotate much. They rotate, but they don't rotate a lot. Okay. Cause the blades are offset. When they hit something hard, they push, they torque harder. The harder the material pushing on them, the harder they push back. That is Newton's third law for every action. There is an equal and opposite reaction. So in soft tissue, the single bevel will just roll a little bit and it'll turn a quarter turn just right through the ribs. Right. And then when you hit, say, this a pretty soft scapula shot, like it, one that pretty much a lot of broad hits could could make, right? Not when I talk about quarter and two, you know, point of the shoulder stuff, real hard bones. We're just talking pretty moderate hard. That bone's going to try to stay in place, and the broad head's going to try to torque, and the bone's going to push back. Now remember, it's covered with meat and tendons and superstructure as well. This is where. When you see these guys, it's all coming here in the next three months. These idiots shooting bare bones with a bow. It's a complete misunderstanding of breaking bones. Now, you can't shoot deer because it's a wanton waste law thing. That's why the pigs are great. There's no laws. So God. in their defense, they can't legally shoot the shoulder meat and waste it and then post it. And here comes the feds. I got that. But the clickbait bullcrap of having a bare bone up there completely misconstrues the ability of any broadhead to break a bone because you don't have the meat on there. And the meat, the first impact's like a catcher's mitt, okay? And then it breaks through. And all of that meat's hanging onto the bone, trying to pull it back. And then the bone's like, no, I don't want to do this. And they tend to fracture. When it finally breaks, it doesn't break... On a double bevel head, it'll just break. It'll just cut the slit. But that torque makes the bone explode. The longest bone break we had this weekend was an inch and an eighth wide broadhead, and the break was four and a half inches tall in the scapula. And where the broadhead Crap. hit, where the broadhead hit, there was a hole. It broke the front of the scapula off, and then what it does is it clears it. Here comes the shaft behind. And it. And that's a single bevel. Yeah. And I looked at that and I said, whoa, 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 back up. And I ran over to my little box. Well, it's not a little box. They got a box full of crap. You wouldn't believe. And I got the same mass, 200 grain, double bevel, machine from the same company. And I told, took Jeremiah back to 20 yards. And I said, shoot that son of a gun right in the shoulder blade. And I pulled a new pig up there. We had shot him that morning and we were cleaning him. We were just going to shoot him a few times. Okay. It went through the bone. It exited eight inches. But it had six inches of shaft sticking out the other side. So it was a lethal hit, and it broke, broke through the bone. This is about a 580 grainer. It wasn't really heavy. Oh, no, it was 630. Excuse me. It had an underground brass insert. So it was about 630. Every single bevel we shot, we had to put a target behind the pig because it, would, it would, wouldn't slow down. We had to catch them. We didn't want them hitting the ground, and we wanted to see the broadheads after hitting the pig, so we'd catch them in a target, right? The double bevel twice in a row was lethal. Don't get me wrong about this. The thing was going to die. Okay? This is your horsepower comment. But it only penetrated half the arrow. About six inches were sticking out the other side. Whereas the single bevels, we had to catch them in the target. They kept going. That is, that is free extra juice just by broadhead design. It's 20% better or whatever. It's 10 or 15% better. 
Remember, same I said arrow, they're both lethal same bow. hits. Right. All the pig would have done on the double bevel is broke the shaft off and died. Same distance. There would have been no death. The same thing results the same. Pig goes 70 and goes down. I got that. But that's that hit. What if the next one's in the ridge of the scapula and it's even harder? Yeah. Right? We know for a fact every single bevel flew through and hit the target. And the double bevels didn't. They didn't hit. They didn't pass all the way through. Yeah, right. It was. I actually said that too. I do this a lot. I do all kinds of stupid experiments and break a bunch of stuff. Here's all the arrows. Well, this isn't all the arrows. This is... This is the set that got destroyed, or I got to refletch all these arrows. They're all covered in blood <laughs> and gory. And that's not all of them from one test session. And when I saw that double bevel thing, I was like, wow, that's really cool. So the horsepower comment you asked about, that's it right there. Would you rather have so, an arrow that you have seen completely pass through every time or just kind of go through? If single bevel is the way to go, mm-hmm. then how come you came out with a three blade? Because it's a, everybody takes steps in their life. Very few people I know are going to go from 400 grains to 650 and jump off the ship. They're going to go to 400 grains and spine up. They're going to go to 525 and fiddle around. That's why I'm also sponsored by Magnus. They don't make a single bevel. But they make a kick-ass, yeah. American-made, guaranteed for life. Mike Som's a great dude. Replaceable blades. But those damn things work awesome. So if you're shooting a mechanical and you start snorting a little fairy dust, but you're not getting all the fairy dust, and there's no uh, <laughs> fentanyl in the fairy dust yet, then you're just going to take a little bit of drugs and fiddle around. The three-blade has significant advantages over any other platform you can sharpen it yourself easy it's machined and it's not going to break and then they'll take the next step after that so what do you say to the guy um which let me say this i i did i did play around with it this year okay i did try it and um what do you say to the guy who shoots a really heavy arrow but shoots a mechanical it's newton's third (laughs) it's newton's third law so it works. For, it, it works okay. It works. What you're comparing is mechanical and light to mechanical and heavy. Okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So take shoot the cutthroat and watch what happens. It's going to go through the deer and skip off 50 yards into the freaking corn pasture and you're going to go find it. Uh, right? Uh, oh, yeah. So Trust me, yeah. What you're doing with a mechanical with heavier, it's better off, but you're actually pushing harder on the target and the target's pushing harder back. So you're actually messing with the physics there. I, have, I I will agree that they push harder, so they probably work better. But the physics state, and nobody has beaten Newton yet, that for every action, there's an equal yeah. and opposite reaction. So if you have this heavier impulse of momentum on the target, it's going to push back harder than it did on the light arrow. It's an equivalent reaction. So I think you're pissing up a rope. It might be a little better. I'm, I would be fearful for blade damage. Well, and let me just, and not that, I mean, I'm a whitetail hunter at heart, yeah. so I'm not putting down whitetail hunters, mm-hmm. but everything I shot was just a whitetail. And, you know, I never hit bone with one. Um, there was never a, a mishap or a mistake. Yeah, it was, so all, it was all plan I A I can't stuff. truly say. It's Yeah. Um, yeah, but you have history with them. From, I, I want to. You have history with them from light arrows, so you know what your history is, and they probably saw right. better results comparatively, right? Yeah. Okay, I would yeah. agree with that. Come here. Yeah, I'm not that much. Um, I'm not that impractical, right? I'm not just standing here on my soapbox screaming, "You're an idiot." I got that, but the example of the double bevel and the single I, bevel is kind of the horsepower thing. Just that broadhead change. The same platform, same width, same machine, same company. <laughs> And it was that much better. I was just sitting, I literally uh, sat there and go, wow. My, one of my biggest things on uh, single bevels, and, and you alluded to it, is that they're so easy to sharp, uh, to sharpen, I should say. Um, now, and, and I've heard you say that before, that that the sharpness of broadheads are so incredibly overlooked. Um, so A, how important 
what are you looking for? When do you say, okay, this is sharp enough? Because so many old rednecks are like, oh yeah, it shaves the hair on my arms. We're good. Um, let's let's go shoot. Is that? I mean, what's the standard of sharpness that you're looking for? That's the easiest one to just to uh, do. If it'll shave, real easy, and I actually like them where the hairs jump off. You can actually get them sharp yeah. enough that there's no that the that the hair the hair on your leg or whatever doesn't even end up on the on the blade. It just but if it'll cut, yeah. if it'll shave your leg, it's ready to go. The trouble with a lot of broadheads is, and I'll give you an example. The platform we were short, we were testing this weekend. We had trouble with. They were supposed to be Rockwell fifty five. They were S seven tool steel, single bevel, a new design. Okay with some kick-ass features. I can't wait to bring that thing out. But we kept having these chatter. We kept having tips break off or bend. And we couldn't figure it out. We pushed them. We put them in a Rockwell smasher, and it was they were at 42. Now, so they're way, they're way soft. Okay? I do not know what the base steel's Rockwell is. I'm going to ask the company. Just so I understand that when the steel is given to them, what's the Rockwell? Is it twenty? Right. Yeah. Or is that? Or is that the? Is that the? Is forty where it comes out? Okay. And then it's supposed to be hardened to fifty-five. Okay. Most of the real high uh, quality single bevels that are machined are somewhere in the fifties, and that seems to be able to retain the edge and not chatter through bones and stuff, not break. Chatter means it looks like a chainsaw tooth, and if that's happening, yeah. that is worse because the inside of those brakes is flat it's not better people think oh it's all shredded up no it's terrible you want that long edge to be nice and sharp so the the sad thing about it was we put it on a best tester which is this little deal has a has a scale on it and this piece of material that they have uh calibrated the machine to and you push down on it and when it separates it, it locks the number yeah, the steel was so soft, kind of like the Wiki example we talked about earlier, that it scored at razor blade sharpness because I got them that sharp. However, on impact, they were dulling like a hammer and chattering. So the moment they the moment they impact, they were dulling. If they hit something hard, when we sh- when my shooter missed the scapular or whatever and hit the rib cage, they were fine. Plan A was fine. Plan B, the headshot that I put on it, look, both sides were just shredded. I mean, that's solid bone, right? And we kept going, what the hell's wrong with these things? And until we pushed them on the Rockwell scale, we found out they were soft. Well, soft steel does get terrifyingly sharp. And it was the, it was hair popping. You could run it down your arm and you didn't feel even hear, feel the hairs get cut. The hair just disappeared, just flew off. They were awesome. They were at razor blade sharpness at in the quiver, on my arm, and in the air. And then they ran into the animal. <laughs> and because they're so soft, our results were wide and varied. Plan A, they were yeah. fine. Plan B, they were not. I don't care about plan A. Because I want the people who pull a shot or something goes wrong and they jump the string to still succeed. We can't put it out like that. I guarantee you, they were so soft that regular people, average skills would make them this would be the sharpest thing they've got in their house, probably, until it hits them, until it, until it is used for its intended purpose, and then they who knows what's going to happen to them. Wow! So that is so that is huge. I call it. So if somebody doesn't running. have a tester at home, how can they even tell? Will this hold the edge up when I shoot it into something? You know, so you know what I mean? That's a great question. And I just covered this in one of my videos. If you're shooting any broadhead platform currently and you consider your broadheads disposable, I talk to people all the time. We say, well, I just throw them away when I'm done. They're kind of wrecked. The mechanical world's full of this. They shoot once and they go, okay, it's wrecked. And they throw it in the trash and get another one. One of these days, that's going to cost you. One of these days, that blood trail is going to be wrecked be before it goes through. It's going to be, it's just that you're going to struggle on one. It doesn't cut the internal organs as efficiently. Thus, you're not going to have as much blood with the capability of leaving the chest wall to get on the ground. 
then you're going to blame the broadhead. And you're right. The broadhead dulled on impact. And then it cut inefficiently. Let's say it dulled to 50% of its cutting capability. So it cuts the internal organs at a 50% rate. Because lung tissue is real mobile. And if it's yeah. pushed like with a screwdriver, it'll just move out of the way. It will. Arteries are semi-muscular. They're relatively durable. They're like rubber bands. You get something like a butter knife and you push it on a rubber band, what does it do? It just keeps moving. Stretches out of the way. Pop, boop, flips over and it didn't cut. So then your blood trails and your the tracking distance lengthens. The capability of the amount of blood that's coming out of the vessels is reduced. Blood trails reduced. The holes aren't as clean. Like when you cut your finger with a razor blade and it bleeds for like nine hours and you can't ever stop it. You cut your face shaving, right? It just bleeds forever. That's what you want. But it needs to go through the thoracic wall first and still be like that. So that's, that is the answer to all the questions of people who said, man, I shot them right where I should have. I don't get why. I mean, I saw it go in. I saw it come out. Well, it pushed the lungs out of the way and kept going. I think a lot of people shoot their broadheads three or four times and don't sharpen them. Oh, no. I mean, I, they're, they pull them out of the target and the, bah, put, them in the, put them back in the quiver. The majority of guys you talk to never sharpen broadheads, ever. Right. Or they're they shooting expect... Shooting into your target, whatever percentage of reduction in cutting quality that happened over two or three shots, you have now taken 100%. You've taken an A-plus broadhead that could have eroded to C. This is, I stole it from Aaron Snyder. I thought it was a great example. And then you've taken that, you've removed it, you've pulled it down to a B plus broadhead, and it's going to go to a D. Yeah. If they're if they're equivalently going to erode, okay. Let's just say the erosion is equivalent. If you started with A plus, you're going to go to a C plus. If you started a B, you're going to go to a D. Right. You're going to go to a pi C D, and so the cutting quality goes down from that A to a D plus C level. Assuming the erosion is the same, then it's exactly the same shot, which never happens. But it's an easier thing for people to frame in their head. So you have intentionally set yourself up by shooting into the target four times for a sh less sharp broadhead. And if it erodes, it erodes from a lower starting point. So what it's is your... It's terrifying. What is your sharpening process? How do you get a, a, a broadhead razor sharp? Most people use a jig or something. I'm getting ready to, I just started, I just did a partnership with WorkSharp Tools and I'm going to come out with a video with one of their tools that's just phenomenal. I currently sharpen with um, a jig and use 300, 600, 1,000, 1,200 grit, grit stones. And then I go to a strop. And stropping is next level. It's 10 or 15% better when you strop. It's just like, say that one more time. One, three, five. I, I use 300, 600, 1,000, 1,200. But that happens to be the set I have. So if you have three, six, nine, twelve, fine, right? Whatever set you have, but you, you should probably get to at least a thousand grit on your stones. Ceramic is kick ass behind that. But a strop, ho. Oh. You only go backwards on the strop. You don't cut into the leather. You pull backwards. But what a strop does is you have an edge that, so, let's just say it's, it's pulling hair. It's a leather. It's, it's, you Go ahead. I think I know where you're going. Uh, go ahead. You, you, you're good. Okay. So a strop is on a piece of wood. There's a bunch of different sizes, and they have relatively coarse leather on one side. And on the other side, they have a piece that's glass slick. And you pull the broadhead backwards. At the same angle you've been sharpening on the strop, do like five on one side, five on the other, and then flip it over. And what a strop does is when you come off the stones at a microscopic level, the edge of the blade is still relatively rough, even if it cuts air. It's got little jagged edges. They're microscopic, okay? When those break off, it's like breaking a stick off a tree. And if, it, if you get a long tapered stick, but you break it at the base, it's fat on the end. Okay. 
those teeth that are on there when they snap off, it's not sharper. It's blunter at the bottom. And a strop pulls those microscopic little bits off there and makes the edge even finer. It makes it like glass. And so th- what I was going to ask on the, on the strop, you, do you just, so take single bevel, for instance, are you just pulling back on the blade side or no. do you do the, the burr side as well? I do the burr side as well. Both of them. Yep. Gotcha. Cause it's going to move around. Very cool. And it grabs yeah. it and pulls it out. When you have a brand new strop, you'll see it. You'll pull back the first pull. You'll see gray. Well, that's all those little chunks of stuff in there. There's, there's videos on YouTube on how to clean a strop too. And you need to do that occasionally and get all the bits and chunks out of it. But, and clean your stones too. You need to spray them down with water. That's what's nice about diamond stones. They don't rust or anything, right? So, but you need to clean You've got the, the world's largest strop, don't you? I do have the world's largest strop on the Ranch Ferry store. We had to build the world's largest strop because adult broadheads are long. <laughs> and when you shoot a three inch long, 300 grain broadhead, you have to have a strop, you know, wide enough. And there wasn't a strop out that was, uh, wide enough for a tough head. I heard a guy one time, he, somebody asked about a hundred grain broadheads and he said, dude, that's in the little kid section. You can go over there to the little kid section. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I find out he shoots just one twenty fives, and I'm like, yeah, right. So I'm like, you were I, just making fun of the hundred. The only way they make them lighter is to take the material out. Which makes them weaker. Just, just, right. Just put that in your head. You're way better off shooting an aluminum insert with a 200 grain broadhead than you are shooting a hundred grain insert and a hundred grain broadhead. You're That's way actually what off. I was going to ask you. Mm-hmm. So, so where, where's the difference lie? So say I'm building a set of arrows Mm -hmm. and I can either go, I can either go 200 grain cutthroat with a 45 grain ethics outsert, or I could go a 125 grain ethic outsert with a 125 broadhead, same weight out front, but you've shifted the weight differently. How does that play a big difference as as far as insert weight and broadhead weight? I asked the man himself. Dr. Ed asked me this question. And he said, when I finally got carbon shafts, because you got to remember the study started with wood, went to aluminum. Right. He's pre-carbon. Carbon shows up. and all FOC was known. The aerodynamics world has known about FOC. He knew about it too. But they, he couldn't do it. Like aluminums were heavy. So you're kind of, you could get to 15 or 16%, but you couldn't get up in the 20s, high 20s. 30 is supposed to be a unicorn arrow. It's really hard to build. But, he said, when I realized how important four to center was for penetration on target, I searched the world for, and I got target shafts. And he shoot a longbow, mind you, so he can shoot a under, he can shoot a low spined arrow, super light. And he said, I shot whatever inserts they sent me. And most of them were tiny little 15 grainers because it's a target arrow for recurve, right? He said, I had no failures on structural integrity of the inserts, shooting A's and buffaloes. With the with the big tough head, three hundred grain with a hundred and twenty five grain glue in insert inside of it, right? He said I didn't have any any failures. He did break broadheads in the study, right? That were that were not high performers. The broadheads broke or sheared off or whatever dulled. But he said I had no failures, and I have seen the same thing. So I've shot sixteen grain aluminum inserts. We've, we've got them for the Sirius Supernova. And a couple other heads, and I put a 300 grain head on it. And this broad head right here is actually two, two, 277. So, is that what that says? Oh, 27%. No, this is a 814. This is a 400 grain, 425 grain point. 300 grain broad head, 125 grain steel adapter glued in the back. And I shot an aluminum insert, and I've had no failures at all. So, what? Where where's the difference though to say like do, does it change anything if you put you know so say our goal is 300 out front yep we can either have you know we can have 125 in the broadhead and 175 in the in the outsert system mm-hmm. or we can have 125 in the outsert system 175 out front 
mm-hmm. or 100, 200, 200, 100, you name it. Mm-hmm. Does it make any difference? Or sure. is it still the front of weight, the, the weight that I have in the front is the weight that I have in the front? So speaking about toward the center and all that stuff, it doesn't make any difference. But what you, when you add more inertia behind the broadhead, which is the heavy insert, you're actually putting stress on the broadhead. Gotcha. So you're actually better off having full way forward to center. It's not way forward to center. It's not going to make that much difference. But when you're flying, you're flying to a target and you're impacting a target, you want the smallest amount of inertia behind the broadhead you can possibly get. It's a little impractical statement because the broadhead arrows are long. They're relatively heavy comparatively, but you're way better off shooting the heaviest broadhead you can and lightening up the inserts. Yeah, because they're gonna they're the inertia, they're, the inertia is in the space this big in the broadhead or whatever, and it's gonna just go doop. And then the single bevels are so efficient on impact. They just there's just not a lot of resistance. They have you shot a you've shot a few animals with the cutthroats, right? Oh yeah. I shot just, tell me what the sound three. is when it hits them. Um, death. <laughs> it's just nothing. Um, there's no sound. Yeah, doesn't hit them really. It just cuts through. When I, when this it, weekend it doesn't when we punch shooting, them. Right, it just goes choop, a lot. I've had multiple people say, "Dude, I thought I missed and the deer ran over and fell over." <laughs> right, because so, they're waiting to hear that. Boom. Yeah, right. There isn't one. You you're more likely to hear yeah. it hit the ground than you are hit the deer. You're likely yeah. to hear it stick in the dirt rather than hit the deer. And this weekend, when we were shooting, you could hear a chut sound. And when I heard that, I said, great, you hit the bone. But it was just this chut. It's not like crack or pop or anything. It's just chut. And I was like, great. And uh, when they hit the when it hit the thoracic wall and he missed the bones, it was a little bit of a thumpy sound, a little, thump, little thump, you know, like popping a rubber band. No. Nah. I did get I did get mad this year, and it wasn't the cutthroat's fault. Um I told Tom it was, but uh-huh. it wasn't the cutthroat's fault. I had a bear at 13 yards, and I just shot a bit high, mm-hmm. and I never found that bear, and the blood was horrendous. Yeah. I mean, just stupid bad. Yeah, now, muscle hits granted, that's on a, bleed pretty good. And that's on a bear, too, where they don't bleed good anyways because mm-hmm. all the hair soaks it up anyhow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I probably caught top of back lung. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, I mean, just the blood was horrible and the guys I was hunting with were just like, yeah, it's a stupid, that stupid single bevel, dude. All it does is put a little slit in it. And I'm like, uh, I think you're wrong, but, um, yeah. So that, that was frustrating, but definitely not the broadhead's fault. Well, they can't blame the broadhead if there's a lot of blood on the ground. That's just shooter yeah. error. I mean, you just eat that and keep yeah. moving. It exactly. Just, it's going to uh, happen. It's going to so happen. That's what I... I did, um, I did come home and, and I shot, um, I shot three deer with cutthroats and all of them, all of them died within 50 yards and piled up. So yep. yeah, they're, the single bubbles are really fantastic, man. On the same note as single bevels, mm-hmm. how important is it to shoot the same bevel as your arrows are fletched. So this is a great question. In because, other words, uh, if there's sh- more going on than that. So first of all, we're, I'm going to start at the animal and back up. It's a sheer disaster for an arrow that is spun right with fletchings to want to go left. If you shoot a left bevel out of a right fletched arrow, you are absolutely asking for major problems because the broadhead is going to want to go left and the arrow is already going right. People, I've had some people say, that's going to torque like crazy and cut a big hole in them. Well, in plan A, you're not going to know any different. But if you hit something hard, you've got this arrow that's at a war, right? But here's what we actually found out on the high-speed camera. Most people don't know. Hang on. Ugh. Most people don't know that broadheads drag in the air. This is why they don't fly when you have oh, a yeah. really untuned arrow. They don't conceptualize it. I have an uh, example that I when I'm talking, and I have a an arrow that's fletched on the front and the back. And pe- every time I hold it up, people start cracking up laughing. I said, hey, can you shoot that straight? And they said, no. And I'm like, what's the difference? Is it, this is a fixed blade broadhead. And all of a sudden, you see them go. 
バンバンバーンシェーハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハ On high speed camera, I had a left bevel on a right fletched arrow, and the arrow took off and was doing this. And then it, it starts、off. to go left before no, it, it corrects itself it to go right. It didn't know what to do. So the first thing、yeah. moving is the broadhead until it clears the string. Well, it's already trying to do something before it comes off. And it would go like this, and then all of a sudden, but it might wobble off. It, they would wobble off the shot line sometime, then correct and take off. Like one of them would shoot down the middle, and the next one would go left about six inches. Because it was knuckleballing,、so, and then it would spin. Now, I, I know what answer I give people. Okay. But when they get a fresh set of arrows, they've just ordered a new dozen arrows. That's the most exciting day in a man's no, life. No, I hate doing、they've、that. Because then I got to bear shaft them all. It sucks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like yeah, it. Right.、Um, Most dudes just go, all right, I'm going to fletch it with a three degree right helical. Okay. I, whatever my, my jig is set up to fletch.、Mm-hmm. Do you do any kind of testing to figure out, am I going to left helical, right helical, what degree? Do you, do you do any kind of that, or do you just throw the same fletchings on every arrow and run? So I shoot feathers and I fletch them as straight as I can because they're curved by God. So I don't have to put helical on feathers because the wings are curved. So they're already bent. But I'm going to answer the vein question. No you more. You shoot feathers out of, your, out of your compound? Yeah. Yeah, they're close to you. Feathers are 1.5 grains per inch per feather. So I, I get free forward to center just shooting feathers. They're, they're 15 to 20 grains lighter than veins because I four fledge. That's awesome.、Mm-hmm. Right. So it's free forward、That's、to center. That's awesome. In fact, I even shoot a lighter arrow than I could. <laughs> Which is all counterintuitive、yeah. for me. You think I'd load the ass end up too, and it's stupid. It's a, don't put any weight on the back. That's a dumb idea because it impacts, it turns into a metronome. But、um, the helical, you probably shouldn't shoot more than about three degrees. And if you think you need more, then your arrows aren't tuned. But they need to roll. Fle- straight fletch is a terrible idea. Straight fletch is a knuckleball. And yeah. You're, yeah, you're just shooting something that has no brain. You're shooting, and the thing has no guidance at all. You want it to roll.、Um, I think it was Levi that has a bear shaft video, and people miss this. Some people have sent me a link, and I've watched it. It's pretty short. He was shooting bear shafts, and he was marking which way they rotated, and he fletched them which way they wanted to rotate.、Bingo. So he had a mixed set. No, one said, no one's ever said, Hey, I heard Levi say he has a mixed set. I was like, Yeah, but he sent it. <laughs> he just goes with it. That's, I, at least I've seen that's that exactly、video. what I was getting at.、Uh-huh. Now, now the, question, the question is this, though. Does, would that ever make a difference if my arrow wants to go left, but I, I fletch it right? Would that ever make a difference? Yeah, I they, mean, they stall, could, they stall now, off the bow. Levi probably could, but could anybody really ever truly shoot the difference? I mean, so I got to tell you, and, and that、uh, I hate letting this out, but it is what it is. Because left, flat, left helicals are really hard to find. My arrows, most of my arrows go left. And I shoot left. Really?、Mm-hmm. And they come off the bow. They look so, so much better. And you don't know、so、this most until guys, you do it. So, most guys, what you're saying is their arrow's probably coming off their bow left spin, but they right helical. That I can't confirm, but I just know I'm right handed and I have a lot of them go left. And I have some of the best shafts on the planet right now. And I've had a, most of them go left for me. Is it going to make a big difference?、Huh. Um, not if, if you get the bear shafts to tear within half an inch. So I call that the, the monkey factor. You're the monkey holding the bow. 
and we're not perfect, right? So if you get your tears down inside a half an inch or maybe two knock, two widths of the knock, that's probably close enough and let the fletchings do their job. But if they're tearing right. two and a half inches, then you're asking the fletchings to do their job, right? And it's a horrible thing because when you put a wing on the front, when you fletch the front, that the minute it comes off, that's going to drag. So arrows actually fly more like this. Okay. The point is fighting and the tail of the arrow is fighting and they fly more as if they're doing this than if they're flying forward and spinning. Okay. The, the aerodynamic war with an arrow is how much drag is this thing pushing on the atmosphere Versus how much drag is this thing pushing on the atmosphere? And they fight all the way down range. And you're better off thinking of it as a tire iron tool on a nut, one of them T, four-sided tire tools. And when you try to torque the nut, that's how an arrow fly flies. The front has a certain amount of drag and the back has a certain amount of drag. What most people do is just put a giant ass end on them. I'll just four fletch with nine degree helical. That'll take care of everything. To a certain extent, it will. But that just means your arrows are flying terrible. <laughs> yeah. And you're masking it, right? So are you completely against a four fletch? I am 100% four fletch. Really? Oh, yeah. But you just said don't try to, try to not put as much weight on the back. Right. So by adding a vein, you're adding weight. Right. But they're aerodynamically a little bit more stable. And then there's a second yeah, reason why a four fletch. This is Dr. Ed. Dr. Ed four fletched, he found him to be a little bit more aerodynamically stable. Okay. And when he was on buffaloes, he would bear shaft, get them right, put the marks on them, tune them up. Okay. Well, when you shoot a buffalo in the side, let's just say you bury it to the fletch on a 1500 pound buffalo and it runs about 20 yards and it's dying, but looking back at you, you don't have to witch, look down when you grab your next arrow, you just put it on the string and it's plumb. <laughs> yeah. If you put a three fletch on there upside down, it'll on a longbow. It'll you got kick. a world of problems, right? But she said you could look at the animal and just put it on. If the knock's good, you're good. I was like, wow, that's really practical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I the, I've shot exclusively floor fetch. Whether I'm shooting feathers off my recurve mm -hmm. or. I've I've shot almost four fletch on everything for ten years, and some guys are like, "Does it even make a difference?" I'm like, it "Looks cooler." <laughs> yeah, there's more to see as far as if it doesn't make like a difference. The ball going cooler. down range on a target is easier to see, and then what you do with four fletch is you just cut the vein size down. Yeah, just shorten the vein by half an inch, and you're kind of where you were. But I love four fletch. Yeah, but my vein, my fit. I want to ask really you too. So. Have you shot the new bear um, broadheads yet? I have not. I'm I'm ready to play around with them. I uh, I've got a bow tuned to shoot them, so I'm I'm, re I'm ready to play around with them. But I haven't shot them yet. And I know Aaron just got a pack of them, but I don't think he's actually killed anything with mm -hmm. them yet. Um, so I'm excited to hear excited to hear some feedback on them. But uh, have you shot? I'm going to ask you just a couple here. Okay. You get a lot of guys and I don't think I'm going to tell you anything that you don't okay. know. Um, but a lot of guys are like, man, he's just a dork. Like he's just yep. dumb. However, you're actually very intelligent. Yep. So I like talking to intelligent people and getting feedback on things that way. It, it that way it, I, I gain knowledge. Right, I'm the same way. Have you? Oh yeah. Have you shot? Annihilator broadheads or seen them? Yeah, yet. they tried to get me to. They tried to. We tried to work a deal out. Yep, they're fine. Thoughts? They're a little draggy. At long at now, long range, they, their whole at long range they tend to slow down more. They, would the scoop on the back not take away from penetration? I don't think they're having any trouble with that because three in their defense, three blades cut a cut a three slotted wedge, and so it it kind of turns into a flap. So they have some, they used to have, and I don't, I haven't looked at their website. I don't, I fish a lot more than I would do bow hunting, but um, they used to have something about sucking chest wounds and it creates this vortex behind it. I told them that's a bunch of bullshit and uh, they didn't like that very much. So 
That's absolutely yeah. incorrect. It's not going fast enough. Cavitation does not right. occur until 2,300 feet per second. There's this, com- there's this thing called the FBI. Yeah, they've been around a while. They studied. Might it have with, heard of them. Yeah, they studied it with handguns because they were having trouble with people flopping around shooting back. And twenty three hundred feet per second was where the cavitation started. So we're going a little slower than that. <laughs> just a little. Uh, you know, just a little, a fraction of it. They're a fine broadhead. They sharpen so, nice. They don't bend. They don't break. I don't have any problem with them. I the only reason I ask, I have not shot an animal with them yet. Mm-hmm. But I did miss my target one time while I was shooting them, and it didn't even bust through my privacy fence. Well, it's a three blade. I was like, it's a real short, stumpy three blade. What do you expect? Yeah. But I was like, well, if it can't bust through my privacy fence, I've got a couple issues with it. The short, stumpy stuff is short and stumpy. Okay. One of the most stable objects on the earth is a pyramid. This is one reason why three blades don't three blade machined heads and three p and one piece heads don't tend to bend, break, or snap off. It's a very stable platform. Pyramids are one of the most stable things to stand on, lever on, all that stuff, right? From the physics background. However, the greatest weakness of a three blade, and I endorse one, but it's very long. I know that weakness, so I didn't want it to be real short and aggressive and have short blade angles like this. I wanted it to be like that. I wanted a high penetration three blade. The greatest weakness of them is when they hit something like that, they wedge. Okay, so there's the, each blade does not have an offsetting blade to help bust on the other side, right? Like a two blade head, the other side is also cutting in the exact same plane, and it tends to help it keep going. A three blade turns into a big war. On the flip side of that, yeah. When you hit soft tissue, they make a hole. I mean, so once again, that's not a plan B broadhead. But in plan A, they're... So what you're saying is it's it's great for plan A, not for plan B. Yeah, 100%. You can read Dr. Ed's study. He shot every Zwicky. broadhead on the earth. Zwicky Eskimos. What's your, uh, what's your thoughts we on We just them? have so much better stuff now. We just have so much, so much better stuff. You want to do it for classic reasons or whatever. It's kind of a tratty thing to do. It's super fun. I have a bunch of them. I shot a bunch of, I shot a ton of animals with them. Because back when I was 20, that's what we had. They had bear razor heads. I'm old enough that the Thunderhead replaceable was a big deal. Like the first person to put yeah. blades and a collar behind it and make it replaceable. We thought it was the second coming of Jesus himself. That's how old I am. So. I, my dad still has a pile of those. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're legitimately great. <laughs> they work. They work great. And, uh, but the same thing, it's a plan they brought in. So we just have so much better materials now that the it's really, it's a fine, it's an average brought in, super average brought in. Very average. This, I, you know. Maybe it is because it's like, man, it's so traditional looking and so just no, it's cool looking. I don't know, classic looking. I don't know. Yeah, the bear just, head looks like I, a, the bear I head looks to, like one. I mean, yeah. Right. Well, I told a friend of mine that I would try it. Um, I don't know if you know Chris Perino, um, nope. but he he'll be on uh, here next week. But he shot everything in the world with a recurve, and yep. and I asked him. I said, "What what broadhead are you shooting?" He said, "Dude, I've shot Zwickies for seven yeah, years." Right. Um, he's not, he's, he's only, he's probably only 45, but, um, he said, dude, I've shot those forever. And that's just what I continue to shoot. And, uh, and I said, well, I'll give him a shot. You know, I'll shoot something with him this year. Um, and the reason being, and and this is why he told me he likes them so much is he said, dude, they're so soft that I can get them razor sharp in the field. Like just with a file, I can get them back to being razor Mm -hmm. sharp. So when I sit in my tree stand, if a squirrel walks by, I'll just fling an arrow at it. You know, I don't mind Mm -hmm. because I can get it back and just with a file, get it back razor sharp Mm -hmm. because they're so soft. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I, I, I did tell him I would try them. So I, I I will try them, but give them a go. No, good for him. I'm excited to, as long as they work, that's fine. I'm not going to tell him not to do it, but I am my, my main head will be the, the 175, um, 
bare single bevel mm-hmm. that they just came out with. Yep. Uh, I'm excited to try that. Yep. And I'm excited that for, have you got your hands on them yet? Which ones? The bear? Uh, the new bear um, no. razor heads. No. Well, we'll have to change that because I want to hear your feedback okay. on them. So, Troy, I ask every single one of my guests, what's your hunting 101 field note? Something that you've learned over the years that that the listeners can take and put in their back pocket and make themselves a better hunter with? You'll never beat them moving. You'll never beat the animals what do you mean jumping by that? the string. I mean that you can't predict how much they're going to jump or that, or if they are at all. And I say that because yeah. I think it's the so, it's the so only trying. thing that could turn Plan A into Plan B, and you didn't miss. That's the hard part about it. In a situation where you put the arrow on target, and then they move. You shot in the right spot, but the right spot wasn't there when the arrow got there. Yeah. They've introduced shoulder blade, bone, they're moving, doesn't help. Get over it. That's my advice. Keep shooting. Well, and that's the the best lesson that I ever received. Um, I was standing there. Um, I was standing there inside of Rocky Mountain Specialty Gear. Mm-hmm. And Tom was giving me some recurve coaching and he just said, he's like, dude, don't worry about the target down there at all. Yep. Like you worry about, you worry about you, mm-hmm. whether it's in the preseason and you're sharpening broadheads and tuning arrows or whether it's in the moment and you're shooting at that animal, you make sure everything that you do is perfect and don't worry about that animal down you there can't. because you can't change what he does. You can't, change what the you can't there's, there's nothing you can do. You can't change what that animal experiences, hears, and how it reacts. You can't change yeah, that. We got to, but what you can do is make sure you do it right every that's time. Right. The arrow, you need to be ready to go. Your arrows need to be tuned. The thing's got to go to your intended point of aim. And then shoot and let now, it eat. I do want to say another thing about you real quick. Um, not that... Uh, Maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't, but I think it comes off when people talk about plan B, we're shooting for plan B or, you know, we're, we're prepping for plan B. People are like, well, if you do enough work in the preseason, there is no plan B. That That's the stupidest thing I've ever it's heard. A stupid like, comment. That, that's dumb because again, we're going back to, you can't control what the animal does. You, well, I, now, I'm going I'm I'm to I'm I'm put a layer on top of that because we covered that. I'm not trying to cut you off. I want to add another layer to that. Do it. I'm not a professional baseball player. I played soccer for I was all district in the in the district I was in in soccer, and I went to San Antonio, Texas, and played with the, those kids, and I couldn't even get on the field. Okay. Yeah. There are people in the bow hunting world, and this guy, your Mr. Perino, is that what you said? Is it's Perino, right? Next week yeah. we're going to talk about him. He may be unbelievably calm under stress compared to average people. There are people who are next level in the shooting moment and it goes, it goes slowed us down and everything's, they're fine. There's a lot of us there somewhere in between that and just absolutely taking a crap in the stand, losing our freaking crap. But that person who loses their crap and doesn't shoot real good on animals is an incredible surgeon or an accountant. Or there's, they've got another skill set that they could make you look like an idiot and just talk circles around you. I guarantee yeah. you, 95% of bow hunting, I can dive into the thoracic wall and make everybody look like a complete moron. Oh, just shoot him in the side towards the front. That's where you kill him. Uh, no, there's a whole lot more than that. So on top of the animals being very unpredictable and the shooting situation, you're on the side of a mountain hunting elk and you're on your ass for some reason on a pretty steep slope and he's downhill and you can shoot sitting because of the slope and that's what you got. You're not standing up after seven shots and six cigarettes at the 3D range shooting the lights out on target 10, but the first three weren't so good. This is one shot, seven days, downhill, 35 yards, and you're on your butt and the wind's blowing. There are people who don't, that doesn't bother them at all. They just go, yeah, I got it. And their brain does the math. Like, and there's a lot of people who go, Phew! you know, 
and they kind of shoot. It just is what it is. And we're never beating that one either. Yeah. Now, what? so let's take a step back real quick. How do you overcome that? I don't want to say overcome it. I know guys who are lights out. You put an aspirin at 80 yards, they're going to drill right. it. They hunt meat, they then they get a crap. deer at 20 yards. Yeah. Yeah. Like but, but vice versa, vice versa. I know guys who you shoot with them and you're like, dude, how do you ever kill deer? And they whack them every time. And then mm -hmm. they whack them every time. Cause they just go into this different mode. Mm -hmm. Like they just hit that different That's gear what I'm saying. and it's kills them. Yep. Like it's just time to kill. Yep. Um, so how, how do you work on that? How, how do you, how do you to fix that? Uh, to, to step on that real quick, I've had more trouble with great 3D shooters hitting my pigs at 20 yards than I have with guys who are kind of okay. Yeah. I've had some 3D shooters who can just shoot, you can back them up to 70 and they're just stacking them. And I get a pig at that's, 70. I guess that's what I'm asking. I get a pig how, at 17 how do you and fix that? Six inches, right? And the only way I've been able to beat it, because I've got it, I'm not the best on me shooter. That's why I try to limit my shots inside of 40. It's one of the reasons why I do that. I just don't think I'm a practical 60 yard shooter under hunting conditions. Okay. I'll bomb them and shoot with you and back up to 150 and all that. It's a course. Why wouldn't we hook up two trucks with a chain and see which one blows the transmission? I'm in for that. Right. But um, the only way I've been able to get past is I get a lot of reps. I'm lucky to have yeah. all these pigs, and I just get a lot of reps. I've made a ton of mistakes. I lost one last year. He isn't dead. But I hunted this one pig. He's probably 250, big, fat pig. And I have a place about 15 minutes from here, and I hunted him about 12 times, and finally he came in. I got the camera rolling. I'm going to be a hero. And right when I shot, he took a step, and I hit him three inches behind the crease. Barrel completely passed through, skipped 20 yards past him because it bounced off a rock. He ran off, and two weeks later, he showed up with another deer feeder. He wiggled, and I waggled. Jeez. Yeah, and I was hunting hard. It was in the summer, too. It was 100 degrees. It was sweating. Horrible. But that's going to happen, and it's just – you just – and it's sad. It's, it's hard. There's so many guys who get to shoot their bows a lot. They don't get to hunt that much, and you don't get a lot of reps. You just don't. Yeah. On meat. It's a totally so, different game. And I, I tell people, and, and just a few episodes ago, we had Eichler on and we talked about our practice regimens yep. and kind of how we practice. And, um, you know, like you just said, there are guys who are shooting great by target 10. Um, but what about shot number one? Um, so I, myself, I practice one shot every morning. Yeah. Just, just one if shot. If you don't get a lot of reps, and that's I've the got, best thing you, know, you can do. That's the best thing you can do. Cold yeah, shot. Yeah, and I've got, I've got nine 3D targets in the backyard. Mm -hmm. The shot is never the same. Mm -hmm. It's not. I'm standing at 20 yards, and there's the deer. Let's shoot it. It's I'm at 17, sitting on my butt, or I'm at 32, and and on a hill, and shooting down, mm -hmm. and or I'm at 10, or I'm at four. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have one shot to make, and that's all you get. Yep can I kill the deer in that moment or the hog or the, whatever you're, you're talking right. about then whether that's a great shot or a bad shot, I'm forced to think about that shot all day long. That's a now great in the way to evening. Do it. That's a great way to do it. Now in the evening, I go out and shoot for reps. So if I shot bad, uh, and, and we're talking recurves, I don't, I don't really practice with a compound anymore, but, um, so if I shot bad, I'm thinking, man, did I shoot on the collapse? Did I, did I, jerk my arm did i drop my my bow arm did i was my hook too deep was it you know and i'm thinking about this stuff all day long mm -hmm. now when i go out and shoot for reps in the evening i've spent all day dwelling on what i did and how i need to fix it and then i work on fixing it next morning i go back shoot one shot and and that's that's how i i practice at least um that makes a lot of sense and, and i have found it to work yeah, yeah. i think eichler is probably one of those guys who's good under you know point of yeah, stress oh yeah. i think he just kills stuff right snyder's probably the same way i've been on with him and uh a few of the guys who really whack a lot of stuff and then there's so many people we don't know who are whacking the hell out of stuff and they just don't post and stuff i tell people this all the time uh the world record deer's already been killed there's some people out yep. there that are ninjas that don't post 
And people are like, there's no way. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. I know a few sneaky guys Dude. who whack elk every year that are huge on public. And you, one guy owns a mechanic shop. And I got to get his pictures from Ed. He just doesn't talk. <laughs> there's there's one right there. Yeah. Yeah, that guy. Um, yeah, he does okay. But I, the, it's funny that he, because I was about to start talking about him. Um, there's a guy named Frank Noska. You've probably never heard of him. Um, I will be having him on soon. But this guy has killed like over 200 animals in Pope and Young. Yeah. He's two animals away from completing the Super Slam for the third time. Right. Like just an absolute killer. But nobody knows who he is because he he doesn't care for people to know who he is. That's right. He calls up Chuck Adams one day and he says, Hey Chuck, I just passed you, man, in the record book. I've got more than you. And Chuck said That's awesome. Chuck, Chuck said, Yeah, but I haven't entered anything in seven years. Oh. So he calls his measure and and comes out and Chuck calls him back and says, Yeah, you're no longer ahead of me anymore. Yeah, right. So don't worry about that. Right. Right. <laughs> um There's those But guys, yeah, dude, right? you're absolutely right. There is guys who just I mean, they kill and that's Perino. That that is a hundred percent Chris Perino. He's like best buddies with Snyder. Um, but you would never know who the guy is because he's just out in the woods killing stuff. He don't care about social My media. Buddy Chris has a writing or works for videos the or state of New Mexico or Colorado. And he's out clearing fire lanes and does all this stuff in the national force. He's out there all the time for work. And he'll randomly yeah. send me pictures of this guy with like a two hundred and fifteen inch mule deer. And he's like this. Just like, yeah, whatever, in front of some barn. <laughs> Next, right? And he said, the dude yeah. is just a hammer. He's just a meat axe. And he does it, he does it with, because of the draws, he hunts with the guns and muzzleloaders and everything. He just throws in for every draw out there. Because if you don't do that out west, if you're just a bow hunter, you're screwed. But he still kills 200 plus inch mule deer every year, and or seems to, right? Or he just passes a bunch of them. But he's, you would never know. He just doesn't. Know, yeah. yeah, he doesn't have any Instagram or whatever. He's just one of them guys. Yeah, I got another one. That's cool. You know? That's cool, though. I I respect the heck out of that man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really really cool. I like guys who just hunt. Yeah, or yeah. fishing and all that stuff. You know, there's there's probably been the world record bass caught. I bet I'm I'm pretty certain that somebody's caught the state record of speckled trout, which is a big deal down here. And they just they're old guy or whatever. They're just a guy. They don't give a damn. Put it probably put yeah. it back. Caught it. Uh, took one yeah. kind of picture like that. Like, oh yeah, I got another big one. Seventeen pounds or something. <laughs> now, I I do remember one time I was trout fishing in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and I catch this mo And I was a kid. Yeah. Not not a kid. I I seventeen, sixteen. Mm -hmm. Um, and I I catch this monster, and I'm like, holy crap, dude. And I'm like looking for somebody with a scale. I'm like, anybody got a scale? And uh, like, I'm like walking up the river with this fish, like asking if I can measure it mm -hmm. and weigh it. And this guy finally had a scale and and I weigh it. And, and uh, he said, you're throwing it back. And I said, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to do with it. Yeah. So I just toss it back in and I get back home. My buddy's Google and he's like, dude, that's the, that would have been the state record. Yeah. Right. Easily. Yeah. And I'm like, what? It's yep. like, yeah, dude, you that was that was the the state record rainbow trout for Oklahoma that you just mm -hmm. caught. Yeah. And I'm like, no way, dude. And he shows me and I'm like, like not even deny it, like it was a pound over and I'm like, "Oh my gosh." Right. But I had no idea. Yeah. I didn't know that. Right. That happens to a lot of people. The only problem, you, the only, especially fishing, right? And a lot of guys who catch a lot of big fish that are kind of specialized in that arena. I think they catch them yeah. and don't know, or they're too far from the boat. They don't want to hurt the fish, so they don't go drag it over there and weigh it or whatever. And they go, well, it's another 34-inch trout. You know, I mean, I've caught a couple of those. Throw it back when it was a heavy one, right? It was a fat one. And yeah. and they just release them. And in bow hunting, obviously, everything dies. So, you know, you know, it's a little easier to post it or whatever to have it found out. But you would also be amazed. Dude, I've talked to several world record holders um, for you name the species and, and they're like, 
I killed it and I had no idea. Like I just, I was happy that I killed a big deer mm-hmm. or a big elk or whatever. And then two years later, there's somebody walking by and they're like, dude, that's the state record. Or that's the world record mm-hmm. easily. And they're like, no, it's not. And like, yeah, it is. They get it measured and it's a world record and they had no idea what they had. Like they just, they were stoked for a big elk and then it's a world record. Yeah. You know, take the guys who don't, nobody ever passes by and says that's a, where they're all their friends have big ones. So they just go, yeah, it's all Freddie's biggest big one. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a no legit kidding. record monster. So those people yeah. exist. It's a beautiful thing that they still do because oh, 100%. it's like a, one of the things that sucks the coos deer thing in January got out on social out in Arizona. What thing? The Arizona coos deer hunting. It just got out on social oh, in the yeah. last five to seven years. Yeah. It's a shit show now. Yeah. Now it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's a zoo out there. It's great yeah. weather. It's easy. It's not easy hunting, but it's great weather. It's a great place to be in the winter. All the people in the snow want to come down. There's people freaking everywhere. And it's just because, unfortunately, you know, it's it's good in some ways because hunting's going to grow because of that. And then all of a sudden, when you go, you're just like, ah, oh, God. And the Western stuff is getting but stupid. I, the draws and everything are getting crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that kind of stuff encourages me because you look at people and you're like, look at all the opportunities that you haven't tried yet. Yeah. Like, did you know that you could hunt coos deer in, in Arizona? And they're like, no, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. And like... That there's such a there's such a a bigger world of hunting out there, and sometimes these whitetail guys they they only get stuck on midwestern whitetails. And you're like, did you know that you could hunt spring bear in Idaho and it costs you 250 bucks for a tag? Yeah. And they're like, no. And you're like, yeah, have fun. Yeah. Like, or or hogs or javelinas or you know, I mean, all of these things. Like, dude, Texas is the greatest place on earth. I just forgot because it's quail season. You can kill anything. I haven't shot quail in probably 15 years and i said one of the people i follow Sounds just like posted it. that they're quail hunting and i was like damn i forgot it's quail season i kind of mentally it's sounds all like you got right an now. afternoon activity yeah all right and that's a legit great sport it's not over this is my this is the best time to hog hunt from in my opinion yeah from now till about may is the best and then if you want to kill big it's ones not hot summertime is the best for the big ones it's a miserable day yeah. to wait but it's a great time to kill big ones oh now that dude, that's my biggest. I tell everybody like my biggest tip is my biggest tip is start hog hunting and javelina hunting. Yeah, like if you are if you're on this fence about should I try heavy arrows or not, build you a set of heavy arrows and go hog hunting yeah. because they're target rich environment. Yep. You're not going to blow your opportunities. It's not like man, I shot at one for the year, I'm done. Yeah, no, just wait twenty minutes, you'll see more. Yep. Um. Or if you're just getting into it, it's a great way to practice, build confidence. Like javelinas are dumb. Like you can you can walk up to javelinas. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there. It's a great way to test equipment. It's a great great way to practice. It's a great way to hone your skills. And those I, are some it's just a phenomenal guys. thing to do. They are, they're never standing still. God, they're a pain in the ass. Not for that. at all. Mm-hmm. The first the first time I ever hunted with a recurve. I shot at a javelina and it was gone before my arrow yeah, got there. Like it hit just dirt because mm-hmm. the javelina was gone. Yeah. Um, and I was just like, wow. Yeah. They're, they're zippy. Well, everything, everything's chasing them yeah. around. They're the right size to eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's cats down there and everything else. Yep. So that country's full of booger bears to eat them. Now, where are you at in, in Texas? I live in Austin. Okay. So central. We hunted, we hunt quite a bit in junction. Yeah. You're about, that's two and a half hours from here. Yep. Yep. New West. You're about two that's, hours from there. That's where quite a bit. We all go there. He lives in Rock Springs. Really? Yep. yep. I didn't know that. You need to you need to call Ed. I will. I'm going to send you Ed's information. We're trying, Ed's an older guy. We're trying to get him out on all the podcast platforms as much as we possibly can. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it, man. It'll be fun. It'll be, I don't know if you'll get video because he's, he's like, I don't know how to do all that stuff. <laughs> Well, we'll just drive down, shoot hogs, and do it in person. Yeah, that would be awesome. He'd love that. I can be there in probably from six junction? hours. An hour I, and a half, I guess. No, no, no from from my house. Oh. Southern Southern Kansas. I can be there. Probably, I can be to Austin at least in about six hours. Oh yeah, you can go to Ed's. 
That would be awesome. He'd love that. Well, Troy, where do they find the ranch ferry at? As if they don't know who you are. You just type, just Google the ranch ferry. Thank God my name's so unique. That's easy enough. We're It'll my primary my primary platform is YouTube. I have an Instagram under the ranch ferry, and then my Facebook page is. I had like a regular account. You can only have five thousand followers, so I'm supposed to move it to a professional account or something. But I'm 54 years old. I don't care. So sorry on Facebook. Don't go to Facebook because it's already full of people. But on Instagram, I'm under Ranch Ferry. <laughs> You've maxed it out. I maxed you just out. Tell people I'm I'm maxed, maxed well, out. It's only five thousand people, but I maxed it out, and they said, "Okay, <laughs> you need to change your account." And I was like, "No, I'm not doing that. I don't. I just. I don't care." So, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, YouTube is my primary platform, and then I post a bunch of stuff on Instagram here and there. And uh, I've got, I've already got videos stretched out to August right now, pre-scheduled. Very cool. Yeah. So there'll be a bunch of stuff. Before lot of we science. go, la- last question. I saved the hard hitting question for very last. Okay. What's the deal with Patrick behind you there on the sh- on the toolbox? <laughs> I just thought that was funny in the beginning, and he just didn't. He just didn't. Yeah, I got SpongeBob with the American flag. And I even oh, okay. I didn't see that, that one. I have a Zelensky fishing lure, the Ukrainian president. Nice. Yeah, it's got hooks on it and everything. So I need to go throw that around. But uh, I don't know. When I started the channel, I just said I'm going to go for it, and I've kind of got a wacky personality, as we all know. And I think we should have some fun in this world. And there's too damn many serious people out there who just need to get a grip. And um, that's my personal opinion. And um. I always thought archery was kind of fun. So I like to laugh and screw around. And then when I get the hate mail, I just keep pressing those buttons just to shock people's system. Um, but the reason that's just back there, cause it was back there in my first couple of videos and there's people like, Hey, it's SpongeBob. You know, I just, I just kept it there. I guess it's a, like, yeah, it is. I guess it's a marketing thing. <laughs> <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. Yep. Guys, there's not many things that I'm going to tell you to stop and do right now. One of those things is to stop and go join Pope and Young right now. It's 45 bucks for the entire year to be a member of Pope and Young. And what that does for you is that helps to ensure your rights as a bow hunter. Pope and Young is constantly fighting for your rights as a bow hunter. They are the national bow hunting organization in North America. They exist to protect your rights as a bow hunter. They are all the time going before state legislators uh, to fight for your rights and to continue protecting your rights as a bow hunter. The record book exists in the first place because somewhere between us and the Indians, people had lost sight that bow hunting was a lethal way of harvesting big game. And so Glenn St. Charles and his group of cohorts, they started the record book so they could take it to different states and show that bow hunting is, in fact, a, a ethical way of harvesting big game. So guys... Don't get caught in, in in Pope and Young only being a record book. They are your voice for bow hunters, and there's power in numbers. So I would highly encourage you to join today because we need to stand together to protect our rights. Also, what you might not know is if you've bought a bare bow, you can go and register that bow, and you're actually going to get a free Pope and Young membership. Bear Archery is such a believer in the mission of Pope and Young and what they stand for and what they do to protect our rights that they are going to buy your first year's membership. So if you've bought a bow, go online and register that bow, and you're going to get a free year's membership to Pope and Young. But guys, I would encourage you, stop right here right now and go join Pope and Young because we have to protect our rights as bow hunters. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Um, Again, everything we've said here is all just to educate. If you love the arrows you shoot, by all means, shoot them. Uh, The best arrow setup you'll shoot is the one that you have faith in. So I don't want to change that. I'm not here to to persuade you in any other way or tell you how you do it is wrong. Um, We're just simply talking about the way we do it. I don't even go as heavy as Troy goes. Uh, Am I wrong for doing that? No. Um, But again the best arrow that you could ever shoot is the one that you have the most faith in but guys thanks for listening i hope you guys have a fantastic week thank you for having me